Today we're going to talk about a rare disorder. Uh, my name is Dr. David Feldman. I work at Paley Institute um, in West Palm Beach, Florida, uh, as well as in New York City. However, uh, today the, a rare disorder called congenital pseudoarthrosis of the tibia. What that means is a child is born with either the leg bent or already broken and oftentimes associated with other diseases. It can be associated with neurofibromatosis one most commonly. So in this rare disorder, orthopedic surgeons for generations have been confused about how to treat this. And so I'm gonna review our treatment because we've been able to get about 100%, really 100% uh, union rate of this fracture. I mean, the fracture is healed 100% of the time and we've not gotten refractures. So I'm gonna speak about our methodology and our methods of treating congenital pseudoarthrosis of the tibia. So basically, this disease is, a, is of the leg bone, and it's surrounded oftentimes by this very like, tumorous tissue. It's almost like a tumor. We call it a fibrous hamartoma. Um, but there's just a lot of cells in there that eat up the bone, and basically that's what causes it. So we know that all these cells are eaten up by osteoclasts, they're called. These are cells that eat up bone. And therefore, we know there are certain drugs that perhaps we can utilize to turn off some of the factors that cause this problem. So what have been the goals of treatment? Well, the goal of treatment is to get the bone to heal. That's called a union. We want to correct the deformity. We don't want the bone to be bent. We want it to be straight because it has a frontal and side bend to it. So we want to get rid of that deformity or that bend. And we want the leg length to be the same and we want the ankle to work when we're finished treating this. So what is our protocol? How do we get this to heal? And this has been over the last couple of years because I too struggled at the beginning of my career to get this to heal. And now we've, we've solved this over the last few years. So intro, we start off by giving something called zoledronic acid and that the child takes about two weeks before so that we turn off the cells or, or primarily turn off the cells to eat up the bone. And then that's we give two weeks before. And it also allows us when we take the bone graft to that the cells won't be there. The cells that eat up bone will be much less, much fewer. And we, we take out this, this fibrous hamartoma, we reset that tissue. We then impale the bones together and make sure the bones align quite nicely. We then put a growing rod or a rod that will grow with the child inside the bone. We then use a large amount of bone graft from the pelvis of the child, and sometimes from both pelvises. And this is actually, I'll talk about this later, but we take more bone graft than anybody probably in the world can take, even from a two-year-old. Um, and that, we, that is actually, most people think they can take bone graft, but we take up to 15 to 20 cc's in a two-year-old, which is really unheard of. We then take a graft of also soft tissue from that area, and we put this all together and we, we, we join the bones together, the fibula and the tibia bone, and this is called a synostosis. We then either use a plate, these days we use a plate with no frame on the outside to hold the bone while we're doing this, and then we give the medication again three months later. And that protocol that you see in front of you, that is the protocol for the treatment of congenital pseudoarthrosis. And these are some pictures and turn away if you don't like seeing this, but this is where we take off the bone. We take off, I'm sorry, the soft tissue that's eating up the bone, and that's called the fibrous hamartoma, and we remove that portion of the bone. We then revise the bone ends, and we make them level, and that's what you're seeing here. And then we take this bone graft, this large amount of bone graft, and we basically almost take it out from the entire pelvis is removed from its bone. And we know this is safe and we've tested this um, and, and this is how we do it. And then we take a graft of the soft tissue um, and we place this between the two bones, creating a very large surface area. And we use bone morphogenic protein as well inside the bone as well. So we're using something to stimulate the bone as well. And we create this sandwich. And this is what it looks like with the frame. And on your left is what it looks like now that we use a plate instead of a frame. And we make the bone straight. And that's what it looks like after. There's a connection of the bone. No matter what level it is, no matter what age the child, we can get this bone to heal and not re-break. And we've done this multiple times in, 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 the, in the last we reviewed it was about 17 limbs. We did this technique on um, getting the bone to heal. And you can see that we've had no refractures in this group. 
Uh, we've had three evidence where we need antibiotics for some type of skin infection. And these are mostly when the pin are used for external fixators. And we've had some locking wires in the bottom back out, which I had to take care of. However, and mainly what we're talking about is increasing the surface area. So while some people have talked about perhaps connecting the bones before, we are connecting it by increasing this huge surface area, which makes the bone much stronger and therefore um, does not allow it to break. And you can see that in this picture, that this is, our, this is the way we are doing it, and this is the way it was done previously. And so this large surface area of bone makes the bone heal much better. This is an 18-month-old child that I treated, and here you can see this is a, this is a typical congenital pseudoarthrosis where the bone is broken, the ends are penciled, and here's a case where I used a fixator, and we never cross the ankle, we keep the ankle moving, and there's two-year follow-up afterwards, and if the, if the leg develops a, bowl, a knock need, we can use growth modulation and allow the bone to grow straight again. And that's what it looks like, and this is the growing rod inside. So this is basically what we've looked at. We looked at the safety of taking so much bone from the pelvis, and we found it is safe. Um, and this is what the protocol basically allows us um, to do. So we get a rapid union in three to four months. We have a 100% union rate. They've not refractured, and therefore, obviously, we do not think that any other treatment is necessary. We took off the... Um, the fixators in about 2015 when I came down to Florida and started using a plate as opposed to using those fixators on the outside of the bone. This has decreased our incidence of any kind of infection from the pins and made it much easier for the child to recuperate from. So they wear a long leg cast for six weeks, a walking cast for another six, and then back into a brace. It avoids the external fixator and it avoids pins infections. So if you look at the literature, People talk about 75% union rates, um, but all refracture rates are very high, and people are still talking about amputating legs that have this disease. We are certainly uh, think that that is not necessary, and utilizing this modality and this treatment, we can get these uh, to heal. So without belaboring the point, you can see some other cases of, you know, of this disease, again, where this refractures, Refraction. This was treated before we treated it, multiple operations, and I treated this from another state where multiple operations and the bone is still broken, and they're recommending amputation at this point because they said they could not get the bone to heal. And in one operation with a cross union, we can allow this to heal and allow the bone to grow. And that's the same child with a straight leg and a leg that is completely healed. And this was both recently in April. And there you can see the bone now in November of this year with a large surface area, completely healed and growing normally. And there's more, um, again, the same thing. Uh, this is a case where um, we did not follow the technique before I knew how to do this, or before I was following all this protocol. And then you see, you can redo it, get it completely to heal, and the bone, is completely healed with a large bone graft with a growing rod inside. So even if it's been treated before, you could still get it to heal utilizing this technique. And so again, another patient, three-year-old, even before it broke, it's just very, very severely bent and you can straighten it and do the same technique. And again, get the bone to completely heal between the two bones. So I think um, we don't want to take any steps out. You know, could we leave out something from it? We don't know. But we'd use all of it because we think that we have what, there's these kinds of results. Um, we think the plate is easier. Perhaps we can come up with a better nail down the road. And what is the ideal age? We think the better, the younger, the better, because the ankle doesn't have all the effects it had previously. So I just gave a quick overview regarding... Uh, you know, the treatment, our treatment of congenital pseudoarthrosis of the tibia. But I think the real message is that your child does not need amputation, that it is treatable, and it is fixable. So um, I think this is somewhat heretic, this, this is somewhat heretical to say in orthopedics that we can do this, but it really is true. This is just a schematic, and if, you, if we had more time, maybe I can go over a schematic of how this is done 
Um, this is more teaching the surgeon how to do this uh, technique. Uh, but basically, again, uh, suffice to say that it is doable. It is a real operation, uh, but the child can run and jump. Does the child need a brace afterwards for early childhood? Probably. We still use a brace, um, but with no limitations in that brace and no limitations to the ankle motion after that first brace. So I'm happy to take any questions regarding CPT. If people have them out there in the uh, on Facebook Live, um, and that's basically uh, my little synopsis of congenital pseudoarthrosis of the tibia in 2018. <clears throat> yeah, so we have a couple of comments, a couple of questions, um, similar to what you were just talking about. Uh, first, Victor Alayan asks, is it totally necessary that we use the zoledronic acid? Yeah, so that's interesting. So again, I sort of brought that up as a question. Do we need all the steps in the cross union? So I think the zomito or the zoandronic acid is key. I think that actually, we can discuss some other ones like BMP, which is not always available in other countries. Bone morphogenic protein is a very expensive drug. It costs about $10,000. So that's one we can talk about. Perhaps we can, if you take enough bone graft, we can get out of. But the, the zomita, the zoandronic acid, actually treats the disease. The disease turns on osteoclasts, turns on cells that eat up the bone. We need to turn off those cells both in the bone graft and around the site of the fracture. So I think that one is really a crucial component to the treatment. Do we need it the second time? Maybe that's something we'll take out down the road. But the first time for sure, at least try, you know, two weeks before is the best, but definitely a day before or two days before is an absolute must for the treatment of this disease. Uh, Suzanne Moen asks, what is the minimum age for the operation? So someone asked what the minimum age of the operation is. You know, sometimes we worry about the anesthesia. I mean, there's some thoughts perhaps we should wait a little older for anesthesia. So I think certainly, you know, above 12 months, the child's just too small. I would think 18 months is a really ideal age. 18 to 3 years of age would be the ideal, ideal age to treat this. The problem in waiting too long is the ankle. The ankle becomes quite uh, deformed if you do it too uh, too late. Um, however, if you do it uh, too early, just the risk of anesthesia more than anything else, you could do it very early, and we certainly do it at 12 to 18 months of age at times. Okay. Uh, Barat Latifaj asks, do you recommend a child to play sports as he or she gets older? Uh, the answer is, can we play sports with this disease? For sh certainly. Uh, they usually play with their brace on initially. We have kids playing soccer and playing everything. Um, they use a short leg brace until they reach maturity. And after maturity, which is, you know, puberty usually, uh, they stop wearing the brace altogether. So we don't stop the brace. We probably could, but we don't because just because of the incidents, we've had no refractures. We want to keep it that way. Uh, but the kids can play uh, in normal sports and normal activities. Uh, Donna Killow asks, how do you deal with feet that are different sizes and ankle deformities that sometimes accompany pseudoarthrosis? So that's, these are great questions. So two parts of that question. One is the size of the foot. That you can't do anything about. That may be, again, due to growth factors involved in the disease itself. So you may have to get two sets of shoes. The ankle deformity, the ankle problems in CPT is a problem not of CPT, but truly of um, the treatment. So I think the younger you do it, the less we have that. However, if they already have that, for instance, in the young girl I showed, she was from Arkansas, um, who had, I think, nine operations before I treated her. So yes, she had an ankle problem. So I released the ankle and usually it gets stuck up, not down, usually not, not in point, but it gets actually stuck the other way. And so you can, I release it at the same time and I do the best we can to treat that. But we certainly don't fuse it and we certainly don't put rods across it. That would be a very bad thing. So we treat the secondary problems of the ankle in terms of the foot size. I think the sooner you treat it, that may be less of an issue, but it may always be an issue in general. And that you have to treat with two, two separate size shoes sometimes. Okay, Barrett had a follow-up question. Uh, my son had surgery with Dr. Paley last year in August. He is doing very well as we were set to see him two weeks to remove screws um, and possibly fix a bowing issue. How common is bowing after this type of surgery? Right. So it's not, it's not bowing usually. Um, usually what the deformity is, I'm, I don't know your son per se, but I think that the, what they get is a valgus. Like I mentioned that before, they get knock need. And so oftentimes that's from the growth of the leg. And that's actually called a Cozen's phenomenon, which occurs when you, you have a broken leg at a young age. 
And basically we use a growth modulation. If you saw in a couple of these pictures, perhaps I can go back and show you, you there was one leg that grew, that grows crooked. And you can see this, I don't know if you can see what I'm doing, but this right here is a growth modulation plate that will cause the leg to grow from crooked too straight. So usually that's the issue. Now, if the children are older, they develop bowing, you can treat that. But bowing in the leg itself is not an issue. But the leg becoming knock need is often an issue. And that usually can require what's called a growth modification or a hemiepiphysiodesis. And that you treat. So some of the issues you do have to deal with still. You've got to change the rod out as the child grows as well. But the, the problem of the bowing of the leg itself would be highly, highly unusual. Great, and then Victor Leon has another question. Um, the Zomita, is the dose altered based on the patient's weight? Yes, and we have a whole protocol for the, the Zomita is absolutely based on the child's weight. And if you read the, you know, the complications of Zomita being, let's say, avascular necrosis or a problem in the jaw, that's when kids, people are taking this for cancer at very high doses. We're only talking about one or two doses. And the real risk is only that we have to check the calcium level within the first couple of weeks. But there's, and then they get a flu-like symptom the first time they take it. It is adjusted by weight. And we have a protocol for that, which we can send to a hematologist or someone who gives it, or a pediatrician who gives this in a different location. And we often have this given in the patients. Either they come down here, or they, would they get it in their hometown where we work with their doctors there to give the Zomita uh, back home? All right, so I think that, you know, those are really great questions. Whoever's asking them obviously has a lot of experience with CPT. Um, but I think it's, you know, it, it's hard to believe actually that we can tr cure this disease, but we really do believe we can cure it. I think like someone asked, you know, there's still issues, you've got to worry about straightening and things like that. Absolutely, changing rods. Uh, also, when they grow up, because these are growing rods, they got to be changed sometimes. So we've, we've, we've cured the fracture problem. The leg still needs work over time, but it is much less than we used to have. And certainly, we have normal functioning legs afterwards, as opposed to what we used to be dealing with. Um, so thank you for listening, everybody, and uh, happy Friday and happy weekend. Take care.